Now, uh, I run this website called followthethings.com, and here's a screenshot of the web. It's an academic website full of academic research, but it's designed to look like a shopping website because people, when people arrive, often on a university website with a university crest on, that's the last thing they want to see because, it, oh, God, it's academic research kind of thing. So it's, it's designed to draw you in through the, its familiarity, basically, as a, as, a, as a shopping website. So there's the various departments along the top for grocery, fashion, electrical, and what have you. If you click on the fashion department, then you might, this is the first four things on here, uh, an undergraduate coursework about ballet shoes, a documentary film about Mardi Gras beads, a newspaper article about um, a blouse uh, that was uh, given to a charity shop and ended up being sold in a Zambian market, uh, non-fiction books about somebody's boxer shorts where this guy tried to find out who made them and so on and so forth. What I'm interested in really is I pick these kinds of stories, books, films, uh, artwork, whatever, that's generated an awful lot of discussion about relations between consumers and producers and try to engage people in ways that hopefully don't people make us feel guilty or blameworthy, but make us feel actually kind of, I want to find out more about this. I want to kind of get involved in this. I want to maybe behave differently. And what today what I'm going to talk about is this particular page um, on the documentary film Primark on the Rack. Uh, First broadcast in 2008 on the BBC, a notorious uh, d a documentary if ever you've heard about it. And in particular, I'm going to talk about these Lego recreations that I've been making with my students. So Primark on the Rack was first broadcast uh, on the BBC's Panorama series on the 23rd of June 2008. Primark was then known as the UK's most unethical retailer, and this was a classic expose, as footage was shown of some of India's poorest people working long hours on Primark clothes in slum workshops and refugee camps, far away from the Primark approved and inspected factories, breaking promises on child labour, working hours and wages. Primark's response was unprecedented. Before broadcast, it cut its ties to the factories exposed in the film, and built a website to undermine its methods and findings. This, they believed, would give them control of the debate and help to move the story on. They then engaged in an extraordinary public battle with the BBC about its investigative journalism, and my response uh, was to get the Lego Act. Follow the Things is a spoof shopping website that opened in 2011. It names, assembles and researches a flourishing genre of work that reveals, appreciates and raises critical questions about relations between the lives of people who make and use everyday things. It assumes that its visitors will recognise its online store format and navigate it accordingly. Over 80 examples are available across nine departments. Most examples, like that for Primark on the Rack, have provoked considerable online debate. Quotations from diverse responses are cut, paces and arranged in sequence under standard headings on each page in such a way as to read like a long and lively conversation about that film, artwork and what have you. Reading a page like this, you move between people's heartfelt soul-searching, angry outbursts, sarcastic asides, cynical smackdowns, forensic argumentation, ambivalent meanderings, unpredictable twists and turns from left, right and centre. You're not the recipient of a single expert view, but become involved in a provocative, unfinished conversation. The film's producer, Dan McDougall, described the dangers of investigative journalism in India. Packed buildings, heavily secured basements, runners and watchmen, drinking dens, brothels, sweatshops, being beaten when you're found in one, being chased through ancient alleyways by angry mobs, having your equipment smashed, your translator threatened with death, local activists intimidated and murdered. That's why big names in fashion escape international exposure. That's why you, d you have to resort to undercover tactics. Pose as a garment buyer, use hidden cameras. You can make powerful films this way. Primark complained that McDougall had faked a 45 second scene in which boys test the stitching on sequin tops. The BBC's editorial complaints unit stood by the filmmakers. Primark appealed to the BBC Trust. After a long investigation, the Trust concluded that it couldn't be 100% sure that this footage hadn't been faked. Notice the double negatives in here. It couldn't be 100% sure that the film hadn't been faked. Primark felt vindicated. To them, this, had, this was an admission that the film was faked, the whole film. A deceived public, they said, could finally know the truth, three years after the broadcast. In 2007, the container ship MSC Napoli was run aground off the East Devon coast. Its containers spilled into the sea, and their contents were salvaged by hundreds of people on shore. This was big news. Uh, I co-authored um, a book chapter about the Napoli, in which we treated the Napoli as a co-author uh, in 2010 about um, material geographies. In 2012, there was a container ship in the Lego catalogue. 
One Lego fan and former merchant seaman said on YouTube that chances are, no matter where in the world you live, your Lego sets were transported on a ship very much like this one. That summer, I bought one with followthethings.com money and built it with my interns. I then brought the box of Lego my daughter and I played with into the office. We recreated iconic scenes from the Napoli wreck, including two people wheeling a motorbike up Branscombe Beach. We couldn't recreate this exactly, though. The only Lego motorbike in Toys R Us was a bat bike. Toys R Us was a bat bike, which Batman and Catwoman wheeled up the beach. We photographed them and fo posted the images online with appropriate captions. BBC journalists were angry, worried, and despondent. Primark was abusing the complaints procedure, had cherry-picked the trust report, was telling outrageous lies, and was far from vindicated. Even if those 45 seconds had been faked, what about the rest of the film and what it showed? Worse was to come. The BBC had to broadcast an apology to Primark. They had to hand back a Royal Television Society award. They'd won for the film and announced what measures they were taking to make sure fake footage never appeared again. Once this was done, Primark said, they wouldn't sue for damages. Primark had put the BBC's investigative journalism on the rack. McDougall, the exposer, was now exposed for breaching guidelines and unethical behaviour. Accusing an anti-capitalist critic of double standards is a well-honed tactic employed to undermine critique. The UK's TV industry was shaken. Executives were self-censoring and the results were clear on screen. Safe, dull programmes. The safest film ideas would be now being pitched to the BBC. My interns had spent three weeks re-researching, checking, editing and referencing the student-produced pages that make up the Follow the Things site. The shipmaking was the start of a three weeks of creative work I'd promised afterwards. We played with the bricks, waiting for a brainwave. Let's Lego scenes from the pages we've been working on. Recreate original photographs and film stills. Scenes described but not filmed. Scenes filmed. Scenes conjured up by the conversations we've been making. Series of scenes, perhaps, representing an example's making and reception. Upload photos to Flickr with catchy captions and links to their Follow the Things page. Tweet them to the filmmakers, artists, authors, NGOs and others who made and were featured in the originals. They could reply or share them. We had a great, uh, one of our first replies from a filmmaker um, of the series Blood, Sweat and um, Takeaways. I don't know if you know this one. And he wrote about his Lego recreation, I love the immortalisation in Lego. It neatly sums up all the emotions in the series perfectly. We quickly realised that these recreations could communicate something meaningful, meaningful and effective beyond the site's conversations. We were encouraged to make more. This was a very public battle about Primark on the Rack. Dozens of newspaper reports were published online and numerous often heated discussions developed in their comments. Others blogged, chatted and posted on social media. This was a scandalous case. A flagship BBC programme faking footage to expose a fast fashion chain. A fast fashion chain silencing critique of its unethical practices. A fast fashion chain more worried about its reputation than the welfare of the people making its clothes. In the end, Primark sales hadn't been affected. But Google Primark and child labour and you got thousands of hits, admitted a Primark executive. This is called the Streisand effect. If you look it up online, it's, it'll say on Wikipedia, it's the phenomenon whereby an attempt to hide, remove or censor a piece of information has the unintended consequence of publicising the information more widely, usually facilitated by the internet. I imagined the Primark CEO had learned about this effect late one night at home on his laptop. My daughter and I started playing Lego when she was five. She'd make one thing, I'd make another. We'd talk, help each other and admire our finished work. Sometimes I'd photograph what she'd made before breaking it apart and returning it to the box. We added to the Lego I'd inherited from my childhood pieces from new sets, oddly shaped colourful pieces from Lego's online store and the contents of lots of minifigure series packs we bought in toy shops. The Lego group claims that its brick system embodies a democratic philosophy of things fitting together, an ethic of thoughtfulness, caring and playing together, which can help build a mindset that is creative, optimistic, optimistic and willing to try new things. Its minifigures enable the role-playing of human relationships and their yellow skin tone, so the philosophy continues, represents the universal and raceless imagination of children. Their faces express Lego's full range of emotion, Disdain, confidence, concern, fear, happiness and anger. My daughter wasn't happy that there were so few girl minifigures. 
Lego, as I, I have to say straight away, is political, even before you get it out of the box. On the 24th of April 2013, the Rana Plaza garment factory complex in Dakar, Bangladesh, collapsed. Cracks had been seen in the day before. Workers had refused to go into the building, but orders had to be completed or they wouldn't get paid. The numbers of dead and injured rose daily. Journalists documented heroic rescue efforts, filmed people being pulled from the rubble alive after days underground, told stories of their terrifying experiences, and spoke to weeping firefighters. Expert, experts were brought in to offer explanations for the building's collapse, to discuss who was responsible and to debate appropriate responses. These issues continue to be discussed to this day. Journalists at the site found clothes in the rubble, photographed them and included these photographs in their reports. Some had Benetton labels, some Mango labels, some Primark labels. This was an expose of an entirely different sort and magnitude. I, tripped my I tipped my box of Lego onto the kitchen table, retrieved the journalist minifigures who'd previously drowned their sorrows and revived the series. Scholars of critical making say that what's learned through the making is just as important as the finished product. My intern, uh, Diana, reflected, to be able to play with Lego for academic purposes has an amazing was an amazing lesson for me on how to borrow from children. Lego is endlessly inspiring. One block can turn into a building, a plane, a horse, a tree trunk, and that blank slate kept the Lego lab upbeat and refreshing. Everyone wanted to see what everyone else was building, was always willing to help their mate. Sabrina said, I didn't have a specific goal in mind other than to be creative, have fun, and begin to think about ways in which academics can engage audiences through forms other than writing. There's something almost wrong but deliciously fun about taking innocent ch little children's toys and using them to depict the more violent and unsavoury aspects of human action and experience. Even if the scenes we created don't necessarily prompt, necessarily prompt critical thought, she continued, I hope they can be provocative or even just cute enough to get people interested or curious about the follow the things work. This was a different kind of expose, a different kind of insight into the manufacture of high street clothing and the lives of the people working in garment factories, a different relationship between journalists and corporations. Journalists from all over the world working for countless newspapers and TV networks documented and explained what was happening and questioned the companies whose clothes were, without any doubt, being made by those dead and injured workers. This wasn't the work of one media company with an alleged anti-business bias. This couldn't be explained away as the unethical work of a rogue journalist. Primark clothing had been found in the rubble. Primark couldn't argue that this footage was faked. The scene showing the moment when Primark executives decided to attack their critics had to be reassembled. The same white office walls, the table, the laptops, the chart, the minifigures, a Lego newspaper tile centre stage. These minifigures, looking scared, exasperated, defeated perhaps, couldn't attack their critics this time. They were in crisis mode. They'd need a different response, I imagined. Geographer Angela Last replied to our tweets with these images, introducing political Lego and directing us to the work of artist Zbigniew Libera. His 1996 Lego concentration camp sets, she said, started it all. Then we found Lego Festo. Between 2007 and 2009, she'd posted Lego recreations from the War on Terror on Flickr albums titled Guantanamo Bay, Abu Ghraib and Darfur. She'd been inspired by her son throwing his minifigures into a toy prison and wanted to see what happened when she used the language of toys and play to depict the real world at its harshest and most unjust. Taking existing photos and or victim testimonies, she made Lego scenes that would strip the original image down to its shocking essentials, as she put it. Her recreations were at once sanitising and horrifying. She hoped they would encourage viewers to linger longer <coughs> over them and share them with links to original news stories in order, she said, to keep conversations going even after the news cycle had moved on. Freed, Guantan Freed Guantanamo Bay prisoner Moazin Beg told her that he'd used them to explain to his children what he'd been through. Photographer and activist Taslima Akhtar recounted, Around 2 a.m. I found a couple embracing each other in the rubble. The lowest lower part of their bodies were buried under the concrete. The blood from the eyes of the man ran like a tear. When I saw the couple, I couldn't believe it. I felt like I knew them. They felt very close to me. I looked at who they were in their last moments as they stood together and tried to save each other, to save their beloved lives. Every time I look back to this photo, I feel uncomfortable. It haunts me. It's as if they're saying to me, we're not a number, not cheap labor or, and cheap lives. We're human beings like you. 
Our life is precious like yours, and our dreams are precious too. Heart-crushing, overwhelming, creepy, sad, staged, beautiful, actor's, fo actor's photo was shared hundreds and thousands of times online and quickly became the iconic image of the collapse. It was used in online petitions that millions signed, demanding that clothing brands admitted complicity in their deaths, paid compensation to victims, and ensured this would never happen again. An effective Lego recreation is one that captures and evokes an aha moment, a dynamic interaction, an emotional richness, like a freeze-frame sculpture. Lego versions of Augusto Boal's image theatre, in which activists, students or any group are invited to form statues that represent a moment in time of an oppressive situation. In the AFOL community, adult fans of Lego, uh, these political Lego scenes would be recognised as vigs or vignettes, tiny dioramas the size of a 6x6 or 8x8 base plate. There's a community of AFOL vig builders on Flickr where over a million Lego photos can be found. With so many people playing Lego as children, artist Nathan Sawyer argues that audiences can relate to a sculpture made of Lego because they can take it apart in their heads and visualise the individual bricks, many of which they might have at home and could use to make a different scene. Source map creator Matt Hockenbury has said that our recreations invite construction in a literal and figurative sense, and this is part of the Lego philosophy. Six months after the Rana Plaza collapsed, 29 brands and retailers sourcing from its factories were invited to the international labour organisation HQ in Geneva to discuss a compensation fund for victims. They were asked for 36.3 million US dollars. 20 companies failed to turn up, including Benetton, Mango and Walmart. But the group's work going forward would be able to build on one company's exemplary actions. Five days after the collapse, Primark publicly accepted its responsibilities. It made available its local banking infrastructure in Bangladesh to deliver any funds that are made available on an emergency basis. And immediately after this meeting, they, it committed to providing a further three-month salary to affected families as emergency relief. The Deputy Director General of the ILO said, we hope that Primark's payment will bring the debate out so that people will ask other brands, what are you doing? This paper is about digital scholar activism. It's about ways in which the new media ecology of Web 2.0 can be harnessed to keep alive political issues that news cycles can leave behind. It's about ways in which creative, evocative, mischievous academic making can mess with and perhaps enhance the power of academic critique. It's about ways in which artistic skills can be nurtured, informed, experimented with before finding an audience and a purpose. It's about thinking through the to and fro between this creativity and the properties of the materials you're working with. It's about working with materials that your audiences will have some experience of working with too and how this can affect their response to what you make and share. It's also about the ways in which a digital photo from my phone ends up on your computer screen or the computer screens of Primark management. This is in my imagination. Surely they must have learned about the Streisand effect. Surely they must have learned that attacking your critics is a terrible idea. Surely the discovery of your clothes in the Rana Plaza rubble must have promote, prompted that radically different response. Surely you became world leading in your response because you had so much ground to make up. Surely it's okay to speculate about this. And, and finally, surely they must have seen my Lego recreations and to encourage them to do exactly what they did. But I, I didn't normally say that on film. Oh, damn. Anyway, I've said it. Anyway, so uh, that, that's, that's what I came to say. Anyway. <laughs>